RadioCalusa.com. Welcome to the September episode of A Garden Runs Through It, a podcast of the UC Master Gardener program of Calusa County, produced by RadioCalusa.com. I'm Jerry Hernandez, your host and coordinator of the Calusa County program. Our August and September episodes will be focused on the drought and your garden. But first, let's talk about some garden chores and upcoming events. August is coming to an end, and September brings gardening chores. What should you be doing in the garden this month? Well, one of the funnest things you could do in the garden is to plant a winter vegetable garden. Winter vegetable gardens are so easy. They're nothing like the summer gardens. So you can do transplants of broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and kale. You can direct seed spinach, peas, radishes, lettuce, and carrot. And for flowers, you can plant pansies, violas, and snapdragons. September is a good time to consider reducing the size of your lawn. It's also a good time to rejuvenate a lawn with overseeding. But with the drought, this may not be a year to do that. Put your spent annuals and vegetables in your compost pile. Add compost to your beds that had annuals and vegetables that you're pulling out before you replant the beds. Be sure to clean out any weeds that developed in your perennial bed. So upcoming events. Well, you can visit our demonstration garden in Williams at the Education Village at any time. We don't have to be there. You can just go out there and check it out. We still have eight varieties of tomatoes along with uh, tomatillos, basil, sweet peppers, and hot peppers. But in September, we're going to be pulling those out and planting our winter garden. So if you want to check out the different varieties of tomatoes or peppers, come on out. We're at the Williams Flea Market on the first Friday of the month in September, and it'll be on the 3rd. So let's talk about the drought and what you can do to save water in your garden. Did you know that if residential lawn was an agricultural crop, it would be the number one crop in America? Americans love their front yard. When we think about it, what service does the front lawn provide? Now is the time to think about replacing your front lawn with water-wise plants or a ground cover. On today's episode, I'm joined with Master Gardeners Pam, Cynthia, John, Diane, and myself. Pam, tell us about yourself. Well, um, well, there's not much to tell. I was born and raised in Calusa, spent, spent the first 12 years in Maxwell, big town in Maxwell. So it came to Calusa, and I thought I was in the city when I came to Calusa, but spent most of my life here, went away to college and came back and um, took care of everybody else's children. And plus my mine, oh, too. And and uh, then I retired about eight years ago and became a master gardener. So here I am. Well, we're so happy you became a master gardener. So, Pam, tell us about irrigating lawns. Oh, uh, irrigating lawns when there's no drought or drought? During the drought. Oh, during the drought. That's what I kind of figured. Because... When you, when you have plenty of water, you water, you know, almost every day in your lawn. But during a drought, you have to cut back at least half of what you normally do to conserve the water. As Americans, we love our lawn. There is, did you know that if a lawn, not a baseball or parks, were an agricultural crop, it would be the number one crop in the United States. Now, that's a lot of grass to mow and throw in the waste. Warm season grasses like Bermuda grass are more dr- drought tolerant, and but the fescues and rye need a little bit more water. But the Bermuda grass can s- survive several weeks without water. But the cool season grasses may die within a month or two of no water. During a drought, gradually reduce the amount of water to your lawn to one half, as I said before, of what you are currently irrigating. As an easy way to determine if your lawn needs water is to walk across it 
and turn around and see if you see your footprints. If you see them, then it's time to water. If you don't see them, don't water. Uh, here are some lawn maintenance tips. Water at night between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. This reduces the evaporation and the wind will not be as strong enough to interfere with the sprinkler patterns. Reduce your lawn irrigation in half. You don't have to stop irrigating your lawn. Don't let the water run into the gutter. Don't become a gutter flutter. No matter how much you irrigate, concrete will not grow. Raise the height of your mower. Taller grass blades shade each other and reduce evaporation. Do not fertilize your water. Fertilizer increases the growth, which increases the need for water. Lawns in California ra rarely need fertilizer. Good luck. A few simple changes can reduce your water bill and have a great looking lawn. Thank you, Pam. This is Jerry, and let me tell you about myself. I um, have lived in Clusa County over 30 years now, but I'm not a native. So, um, I, you know, born in the Bay Area, grew up in Woodland, so nearby. I went to college, got a degree in agriculture, eventually ended up being with the Cooperative Extension and working in agriculture and the Master Gardener Coordinator. So today I'm going to talk about drip irrigation. I want to tell you, I love drip irrigation. My perennial beds have never looked so good. And it's so much easier than going out and hand watering. So if you want healthy, fast-growing landscape plantings, use drip irrigation. If you want a carefree, beautiful, small area, use drip irrigation. If you want high-yield, weed-resistant vegetable gardens, use drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is less work less water, and better results. Can you imagine using less money and getting better results? So what is drip irrigation? It's a slow, even watering directly to the root zone. The slow, precise delivery of water directly to the root zone of your plants keeps the root zone moist, but never saturated. The plants retain their proper air and water balance and avoid the stress and shock of the drench and dry cycle associated with conventional watering methods. This results in optimum growth and healthier plants. And it's science. I love science. The proper air and water balance. That's all science. So some advantages and benefits to drip irrigation. You save water. You reduce plant stress. And when you're vegetable gardens, that's very important. Reduce weed growth. Who does not want to have fewer weeds? Oh my gosh. It's the, you know, everyone's problem is weeds. You prevent runoff and erosion. You get water-wise plants compatibility. You save money. Who doesn't want to save money? You save time. You're not out there hand watering all the time. You save energy. It's versatile and durable. You can use it on hillsides and plant terrain. A hose can be buried or left on top of the ground year-round. And the automatic timer options. Love that. Set it. Walk away. Just check every once in a while to see if it's still working. So let's talk about actual drip irrigation. So you're going to have a water source, which in my case, I use my faucet. Some people have underground systems, but it's still the basic same thing. You'll have an automatic timer which attaches directly to your water source. Then you'll have an anti-siphon device that prevents contaminated water from backflowing into your um, system. A pressure regulator. This is very important because more pressure comes out of your faucet than what you need. So this device maintains the correct water pressure in your system. And then you'll need a swivel adapter, which kind of just makes everything go in the correct orders. You'll have your main line, and there's fittings, and then you'll have branch lines, an end closure, and then you have all of the drippers. There are many different kind of drippers. There's misters and bubblers, sprinklers, inline drip, many inline drip. There are so many to choose from. Individual drippers, flag drippers, 
uh, it's incredible. So when you decide which one you want to use, you go into your store, preferably a local small store where somebody knows what they're talking about. And you ask, okay, I have, I'm planting tomatoes. Which dripper should I use? And they'll be able to help you. And there's a lot of information online and they have a lot of information printed out too. So drip irrigation, it's made easy and it's the way to go. So if you go to our Facebook page, we have a drip irrigation video there. It's from start to finish, starting with the timer and going all the way into the drippers and how you connect all of your um, hoses together and then how you end it. So go there at UCCE Master Gardeners of Calusa County. Cynthia, tell us about yourself. I'm a member of the Master Gardeners here in Calusa County. I've lived in Calusa County all of my life, went to school here and went to college briefly, but been here all my life. Um, I was in the water business for almost 40 years, so I do have some experience with uh, lots of water and, and no water and drought. So hopefully I can pass some of these hints on to you. Cynthia, tell us about drought symptoms. Okay, first I'll start off with drought is a prolonged shortage in water supply due to below normal precip. It doesn't have a clear beginning and an end like other gardening extremes. Lack of rain and snow over time ultimately results in a lack of soil moisture available to plants. During drought, water restrictions may be necessary as the groundwater table is reduced and reservoir levels decline. On hot days, plants not be able, may not be able to absorb water quickly enough to compensate for water lost in the leaves and wilting will, will occur. In this case, the signs of drought are temporary and plants should recover overnight. If they are still wilted in the morning, then they could be a, that could be a sign of distress from the drought. As I ride around town lately and beyond, I have noticed many signs of the drought. On a recent trip to Fort Bragg, it was quite obvious of the stress on the oaks and the redwoods. There were yellow or dead branches in the redwood trees and lots of shedding of needles. Oak trees had just a few leaves or no leafing out at all. Wooding plants under drought conditions can have many symptoms, including yellowing, browning, or wilting leaves that can develop early color and or burning and scorching of leaves. Last week, I saw a Bradford pear that had changed color and was dropping leaves already. Plants may drop some or all leaves and appear dead. Some leaves lose luster and become grayish or bluish. Tips of branches become dry and brown. Other symptoms may be wilting of leaves that do not recover overnight. Recently, I discovered the irrigation on our ranch citrus orchard had been interrupted for some time because the irrigation was accidentally shut off. A few trees appeared dead, but upon investigation, it appeared most were still alive. I scraped a tiny piece of bark from one of the branches of each tree, and most were green. With irrigation restored, most of these trees will make it. We will let the trees come out on their own, and I won't be tempted to fertilize. We will prune when it is obvious that some branches are dead, and it may take a year or two before a crop is set again. This is a good lesson. Don't panic and be patient. A tree or shrub may not be dead, but may be under extreme stress, and don't be tempted to fertilize. Here are some tips to try to ease the stress in your garden. Apply and maintain a layer of mulch three to four inches deep around garden plants and trees, keeping the mulch one foot away from tree trunks. This retains moisture and discourages weeds. If water is available, occasional watering, well, deep watering will help. You will may have to dig down a few inches to determine if irrigation is getting to the roots. Avoid over-fertilizing when water is scarce. Supplemental fertilization increases leaf production and the need for more water. More mature landscape plants can survive a season or two without additional fertilization. Control weeds that compete with plants for water. Prioritize your landscape plant needs during water shortages. Mature trees and shrubs can usually be kept alive with occasional deep watering during occasionally dry seasons. Although fruit and nut trees can be kept alive during severe water so shortages for a season or two, 
fruit production may be greatly reduced. So I need to reiterate, don't panic and be patient. A tree or shrub may not be dead, but may be under extreme stress. And don't be tempted to fertilize. Last month, Cynthia talked about watering your small trees. And I was like, but my small trees look so bad, even though they're getting the same irrigation that they have in the past. But we started so dry to start with. I have leaves falling off those small trees, both root trees and ornamental trees. So when Cynthia talked about watering trees last month, she talked about on small trees, taking a five gallon bucket, drilling a small hole in the bottom, and then fill up the bucket with water and set it at the tree and let it slowly drain out so that the water is absorbed and doesn't run off. So this has worked really well. I started doing I have five small trees that I've been doing this with, and they've actually never looked so good. And I'm so glad that Cynthia's talked to, to us about that. So if you have a small tree and you want to try this, just take a five gallon bucket, drill a small hole in the bottom, set the bucket next to the tree, fill it up, let it drain out, and then you can set it on the other side of the tree and do the same thing if that's what you want to do. Thank you, Cynthia. John and Diane, tell us about yourself. Well, we've been gardening in Calusa for over 50 years now, and uh, it's been an interesting journey over those years. We've learned a great deal. Uh, we became master gardeners in 2009 and have continued learning a much many things through that through that program. Uh, we're both retired uh, and educators and have uh, enjoyed our retirement a lot, being able to enjoy our garden and, tra and travel mightily. And I am Diane Vafis, and John has pretty well covered it. He was a high school teacher, and I was a teacher at the middle school, just to add a little bit. And we have done a lot more gardening since we retired more than 20 years ago and have really done more to experiment with plants, do further planting in our own landscape, and have learned a lot along the way, sometimes the hard way. We have had our share of failures, but some successes in learning as well. Well, thank you. If you go to our Facebook page, you will see um, a video of John and Diane's garden, and it's wonderful. Thank you. So, John and Diane, tell us about water-wise plants. Well, I'm going to start by saying, as most everyone knows, California and the West have been experiencing more and more extreme drought years. Our reservoirs are at record lows, and our groundwater is being depleted far faster than it can be replaced. Wells are having to be sunk deeper. And so we are seeing an urgent need to deal with increased drought and lack of water. We need to urgently address water conservation. So thoughtful gardeners and landscapers and homeowners are looking at drought tolerant, otherwise known as water wise plants, as one approach to dealing with water conservation. And of course, there are many other approaches, but this is one. Let me say first water wise or drought tolerant does not mean the plant can go without water. Even desert plants need winter rainfall to survive. So this means these are plants that have less need for water than many others and are able to go in at increased intervals between watering or irrigation. Another caveat please remember that you cannot put a drought-tolerant plant in the ground and expect it to immediately go 14 days without water. Plants need to be established 
before they can meet these criteria. And so you need to put your plant in the ground and give it water every day for a couple of days and then taper off as it adjusts and will eventually go to a longer stretch of time, a longer interval between waterings. These drought tolerant plants are not all exactly the same either. So you need to look carefully at the tag in the pot that comes from the nursery or the garden center or look online, even in a garden book to find out a little more detail about the plant that you have chosen. With that, I will also say there's a great variety in these water-wise drought-tolerant plants, and John is going to go ahead and talk about those. I do want to add another thing to think about before you start planting. You're not going to put a water-wise drought-tolerant plant in the middle of other plants that need a lot of water. It's going to be a wasted effort. You may have a new house with entirely new planting areas and this is a great opportunity to do all water wise plantings or you may in an established yard garden or landscape have a bed that you want to change out and you can change it to drought tolerant plants and have the appropriate irrigation for it so now let me again turn to john to talk more about getting those drought tolerant plants and the variety among them. And one of the first questions we have to ask is, how on earth do you tell if a plant is drought tolerant or not? You can start by looking at the zone. We, we live in a Mediterranean climate, which automatically has dry summers and wet winters. So something that needs a lot of water is not gonna thrive very easily in our natural, in natural environment. So the USDA has created zones by climate uh, around the country, and you'll find those on the tags that Diane mentioned. We are zone 9B, which means generally plants will tolerate temperatures as low as 25 to 30 degrees. In fact, they probably could support some but less than that, but that's just, this is your guideline, and, and it's a temperature measure, not a water need. So you could have a drought-tolerant succulent, for example, that will perish if it gets below 40 degrees, so obviously you have to be careful in your plant selection. One of the thing, tricks you can use is to look for native plants. And again, you have to be careful because a native plant, a California native plant could be native to the Sierra slopes or to the sand dunes of the beach and none of those would be appropriate for our situation. So you want to look for plants that are uh, inland plants that are designed to be uh, to grow in our, our climate, which is hot summers and dry summers. One trick is to find uh, native plant nurseries. Uh, there's one in Chico, floral native plants that has just California natives and that they are locally produced. Uh, they grow them themselves. And you can uh, find things there that are very likely to survive in your garden with little water. Another excellent uh, resource is the Calflora Nursery in, in Fulton, which is outside of Santa Rosa. Uh, it has a great selection of California native plants. And on their internet site, they have a selection guide to what kind of plant do you want, how much water will it be able to tolerate, uh, whether it's sun or shade, and all those kinds of things. You can click off what you identify as characteristics and then it will give you a list of plants to look at. Uh, so this is a great source. And generally, you can go on the internet and uh, Google drought-tolerant plants or water-wise plants, and you'll get a ton of lists and names and of things. You have to be careful. This is where you start, and then you have to go further than that as you look at the plants and decide whether you want a tree or a shrub or a perennial, um, herbaceous perennial to put into a, a garden border. Uh, but you'll find all of these choices there that will be your starting point. And once you identify something you think might be interesting, you need to go further and be sure that it meets all the criteria for uh, sun, shade, and so on. Another great resource is the UC Davis Arboretum has produced a list of what they call their Arboretum All-Stars. 
These are all plants that have been tested in, in the Davis area, which is very similar to ours. And they are by and large survivors. They, they are put through some rigorous testing to be sure that they can tolerate a range of conditions. So that's another place to start. There are other nurseries in our area that also have, uh, they grow their own material here. So again, it's, uh, they're adapted naturally to our area. And that would be a Morning Sun Herb Farm and, and uh, Vacaville and your local plant sales. These are plant sales that local gardeners bring things that they've been growing in their gardens to, to sell to the public. So there's another clue that it might do okay in our, in our area. You need to be aware of that. Uh, I've seen at our local plant sale sometimes a lot of plants are there because they spread readily in your garden. Uh, that could be a weed if you consider a weed as a plant that doesn't belong where it's growing, but you need to be aware of that. And I have some in my garden and I've had some that I've fought to get rid of in my garden. Uh, Nacella tenuissima was a Mexican feather grass. It's beautiful, but its seeds go everywhere and you have it coming up forever, well, for years anyway. I, years after it's gone, you keep find, finding them popping up here and there. Another one is the uh, Mexican Evening Primrose, a beautiful pink flower that spreads by underground rhizomes, runners, and it will come up everywhere. It's aggressive and not a, very friendly to others in your garden, so it's hard to get rid of it as well because you have to get every little piece of tissue out of the ground took me three years to get it all out of my garden. On the other hand, I have a Verbena borariensis, which is a beautiful flowering uh, urbania, herbaceous perennial with uh, flowers that grow high on thin stems and it seeds freely, but the seeds are, the plant that, that come up are easy to remove. There's no, it's not a real, real big chore. And the other one is a Mexican tulip poppy beautiful yellow flowers that spreads itself by seeds very happily. But if you can tolerate that, which, which I do, and the, the work involved in clearing them out, then it's uh, something you can add to your garden. So there are a lot of drought tolerant plants. I was just looking at our garden and thinking of the things that I have growing in the garden that can, can get by on water once a week and some of them even less. We have the Russian sage, a pair of sky. I don't think I ever water it. It just gets whatever it gets on it, sprinkling from the things around it. I never water it directly. But your yarrow, agapanthus, the, the Nile plant that you see along the highways growing untended, uh, many salvias. Uh, salvia is a huge genus of plants. Some get to be five, eight feet tall and some are very low growing, but you need to be uh, careful when you select that one because uh, it has to fit in the space where you're planning on putting it. California fuchsia, the red yucca, you see them, I see them all over town, the Hesperalo, Parpiflora, uh, hummingbirds love it, and it's an easy to grow plant, Bulbine, Verbena bonariensis, catmint, uh, Calandrinia as a rock purslane, these are all plants that I have in my garden that uh, do nicely and require very little water. Little water. So uh, you can uh, group these plants together and make, create quite an attractive uh, border or bed for yourself. And because of our increasing drought tolerance or drought conditions, it's more important than ever that gardeners do everything they can to minimize water use in our gardens. Consider reducing your water-loving lawns and replacing the grass with a beautiful bed of drought-tolerant plants, which are available readily in our area. I would like to add one thing to what John was saying. Most all of those plants he have mentioned are perennials, not annuals, and they will continue to grow and grow for you. You do not need to replant a bed every year as you do with some other plants, such as zinnias and marigolds. Less work and more beauty. We love that. Thank you, John and Diane. For more information or insightful tips and gardening hints, visit the Master Gardeners of Calusa County on Facebook or visit our website at cecalusa.ucanr.edu. Remember to sign up for our monthly gardening newsletter a link will be in the notes of the show. 
Do you have a gardening question? Send an email to glhernandez at ucanr.edu. Pam, Cynthia, John, and Diane, and myself, thank you for joining me on another episode of our podcast. Thank you for listening to A Garden Runs Through It, a podcast of the UC Master Gardener Program of Calusa County, produced by RadioCalusa.com. Until next time, keep your hands dirty. Calusa.com.